Good morning, everybody, or good uh, good morning, good noon, good afternoon, as depending on the different uh, timings. I'm very happy that we're here. I see we're 41 participants, but the numbers are going up, so so that's uh, that's very good to have uh, this much interest. We will have a, a very interesting um, discussion today on the value of evaluation in decision making. So we have a, a guest speaker, Michael Spilsbury, who is um, the Director of Evaluation at the UN Environmental Program. Um, and uh, Kevin uh, Summers Gill from um, Evaluation Department in the Union Secretariat, and me, Claudia Schwarz, Regional Evaluation Officer with WFP in Dakar, Senegal. Um, we will try to do the moderation. Uh, so the idea of the session is that it will be that Michael will give a short introduction. And then um, we would like to also hear from you and we would like to discuss together um, on examples, uh, reflections, challenges that we have when we try to foster evaluation use for decision making uh, in our respective agencies or contexts. I was just saying it's nice to see so many people here online, some some familiar names and some some new ones. So. Um... I think my role really is to just give a little bit of a spiel and try and, and kick off what I hope will be a very interesting session and then discussion. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, to interacting with all of you. Um, I will do a very brief um, presentation. It's a little bit sort of in the line of a, of a story. I was really going to talk about use of evaluation from a couple of perspectives, you know, one being, you know, from this perspective of, well, how do you get an evaluation function to be useful? And then maybe finish off with a little bit about, well, how do you make evaluation products be useful? So that, that's basically the theme. I'm, I'll start off with a little, a little spiel about the, the sort of evolution of, of UNEP's evaluation function over time. So when I, when I joined UNEP, in 2005, we had quite a small function, with just six posts, and we were putting out about 12 evaluations a year. And now, 18 years or so later, <laughs> we have a staff of uh, 12 staff, and we're and we're putting out sort of 30 30 plus project level evaluations a year and a couple of strategic evaluations a year. And we've kind of moved from from trying to do 100% coverage of everything to a, a more of a sampling approach and um, a sort of self-evaluation. Um, it's a bit like a decentralized evaluation uh, arrangement whereby we have project managers running reviews in the way that an evaluation would be run, which are then later independently validated by my office. Um, and we're putting out a couple of, of sub-program evaluations a year, so sort of higher level strategic evaluations. So over time, you know, we've gone from quite small beginnings to to something a little bit larger and something I think we've gained quite a bit of ground in the organization in terms of how we're respected and how our findings are taken notice of. And that's been a little bit of a journey. So I was, I was sort of reflecting on that um, and sort of figuring out, well, you know, how you know, if you're a small function and you're on your journey to try and become a more mature evaluation function you know what what should you do how how can you make evaluation functions more useful and it probably applies to large functions too and i think that the main the main thing there is is um, the main focus should be trying to make yourself relevant and useful for senior management and and member states and if you're going to try and, and have useful evaluation fun, useful evaluation function then you've got to really focus on on the quality of what you put out. You're only as good as the last thing you put out. So you've got to basically focus on, on the quality and the timeliness. It's no good delivering something of really high quality far too late to be useful. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that uh, our evaluation office sort of gained traction in the house, gained some, some credibility in the house, was by making good use of external assessments of our function. So in our case, we had quite a different range of external assessors. We have we had the Jeff assessing the quality of our 
project evaluations that were funded through the Global Environment Facility. Of course, we had the OIOS dashboard. We did a peer review, and then we had regular, regular MOPAN uh, reviews every five years or so. And I think you know, at, we were starting off. This was data from the Jeff Independent Evaluation Office assessing the quality of of UNEP's evaluation reports over time, and with UNEP being the blue line, we started off from a pretty low baseline. <laughs> Our, our evaluations were deemed by the Global Environment Facility Independent Evaluation Office to be of very high quality, with only 50% or so um, in the satisfactory range. So that's more, they have a six point scale from highly unsatisfactory through to highly satisfactory. So only 50% 50, 50 of our evaluations were kind of making it into the satisfactory zone. And over time, we sort of brought in um, much more rigorous quality assurance mechanisms um, and the evaluation reports we're putting out. And you can see that that had a very rapid effect um, and boosted our um, the quality of the evaluations we're putting out. But the importance of that was more internal. We were able to say to our senior managers in-house, look, you know, you can trust our findings um, that they are of high quality and they're being assessed externally as such. So that we found was helped us gain traction in-house for um, you know, better use of our evaluation function as a whole. So our findings became better respected and um, you know, the use of evaluation went up. I'm talking about a, a quite an old evaluation that we did in sort of 2015. Um, and I think this was one of our one of our most influential evaluations. We did one in 2011 that was very similar, repeated the exercise in 2014, 15, and we're now doing something similar again. And each time that we've launched one of these so-called formative evaluations, we're kind of looking at the program of work of UNEP, its, its, its strategic planning architecture effectively. And each time that we've done this, it's coincided with a reform that's been brought in by the head of the organization. And whenever there's a reform by the head of the organization, obviously a lot of senior management take note of that reform. And so it's an ideal moment to, to put an evaluation out that speaks to that reform issue and tries to give early feedback to the house on you know, the good parts of that design and early indications of, of how implementation is going. In this case, it was really, as this slide sort of implies without going into too much detail, it was basically looking at a reform of how the results architecture in UNIT was being, was being changed. So looking all the way through from project documents, through different programs of work, through to the high level strategy. We were basically looking at all the dimensions of that, looking at whether, whether the causality stacked up between these different levels, looking at whether the results language was good and 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 basically doing a critique of of how planning happened at different levels in UNEP from 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 the front line where projects are designed and implemented through to the higher strategic levels and, and because it was a reform by the then executive director it attracted a, a lot of interest so it helped that it was of good quality because a lot of people looked at it it's still being quoted um, in in UNEP planning documents, um, and it has had quite a, a large number of long lasting long lasting effects. So, you know, a lot of these at the level of individual um, project documents, which were strengthened as a result of of the findings of this evaluation. So, better problem analysis, strengthened. Um, articulation of causal relationships actually at all results levels, not just at the project level, but through all the different planning documents. A more robust approach to stakeholder analysis throughout the house and an improved clarity of result statements. You know, we now have a, a more robust glossary of what a result statement should look like, um, although we still find we're having to educate the house on, on getting result statements properly articulated. And one of the things that we, we're still battling with and still, still trying to get the house to learn about 
is that you know that activities are not a results level they're the things you do to drive change between results levels and that's something a lesson we're still still trying to get the house to learn but i think um i chose i chose this particular example because i think i wanted to you know convey the message that if you want a really useful evaluation really check out what the demand is and and if you really know the demand in terms of the higher strategic levels of the organization um, in terms of the topics you might look at that's that's going to be a good approach to addressing evaluation topics that are likely to be of higher higher level use to the organization and this was an example that um you know is still is still being quoted today um, and we're building on that by doing another version of it. There's been a new reform, a new ED, a new reform. So we're doing something similar again. This is really <laughs> digging up some ancient stuff. Um, about 20 years ago, I was doing research into how do you get research used? How do you get research to influence policy? And it's a very similar challenge to how you get, how do you get evaluation used? How do you get evaluation adopted how does evaluate how can you get evaluations to shape for example institutional policies or or change behaviors at the level of an evaluant and whilst i was doing this year, research years ago i came across this article in a medical journal and this this picture shows the pile of stuff that got sent to a general practitioner somewhere in cambridgeshire um, advising um, him to change behavior in terms of medical practice or prescription and basically the the thing i'm trying to illustrate here is is that basically sending people re reports or or doing lectures like this presentations and then expecting people to change their behavior as a result of either having received a report or being talked at by a talking head like me for 10 or 15 minutes is just not going to change people's behavior and I think that's a very important lesson for for any evaluator and any evaluation function. You know what not to do. Don't just produce an evaluation report and send it to whom it may concern. This journal article did actually point out some of the things that are much more much more effective um, things to do to try and change people's behaviour. And um, those things include much more interactive dialogue with those whose behavior you're seeking to change it involves frequent reminders and, and basically engagement over time following up if you want to get um, changes of behavior from from findings be it from research or be it, be it from from evaluation so i think as, as evaluators we need to really think carefully about evaluation process as our means to encourage better evaluation use um, and it's those kinds of engagement with those whose behaviors we're seeking to change where we're likely to gain the most traction and likely to improve the extent to which evaluation gets used so that was my little intro just trying to, to give perspectives from from both a sort of the level of a function and then, then also dropping it back to to the level of evaluation reports and how do you get them used how do you get an evaluation process to be high utility so um, that's it from me hopefully that that will stimulate a few ideas and thoughts and um, maybe we can go back to the the hosts some reactions and kick off a discussion thanks thank you very much michael um for this uh, presentation and kick off of the discussion I think we we so so maybe I'll share some first reflections and then I would like to hear a bit from the room. Um, so one thing we had been discussing when preparing this this webinar, I think uh, Michael, you were mentioning that it's uh, but it's not all about the process, but the process is a big part, as you said at the end. Um, by issuing more and more reports with evidence and with things, it's not necessarily gonna trigger action. But if you have a successful process where people are really engaged, discuss and exchange, uh, that can have a much higher effect and also better absorption of, of results of the evaluation and therefore action taking. 
Um, so I think that's something that, that rang uh, very true as well with us in, in WFP because our relations usually take between nine and 12 months. So quite a long time of engagement. And if you get that engagement right and you get the right stakeholders around the table, so not just internal, but also external uh, partners, then you can really start up a dialogue on what you're doing, your project and uh, where you're going, rather than just having basically a group of people um, do some interviews, write a report kind of in secret and then leave again. So, any reflections? Uh, the floor is open. Anybody can talk. I totally agree with the points that you raise, uh, especially uh, about uh, um, behavioral uh, change. And uh, I know that there is a group which really worked, the uh, UNEG group on behavioral change. Uh, that's why it's matter. And also about the process and quality. But I was wondering, um, or maybe uh, want to ask others as well, uh, whether there are reflections about independency and non-independency of the function and how uh, the setting uh, of evaluation office and the fact to whom it primarily reports uh, also uh, influence uh, evaluation use in organization. Uh, maybe we can discuss also this because I was working in different settings and uh, noticed some uh, some change. Thank you so much, Claudia and Michael. Great to hear hear your presentation. Uh, I I totally agree with with what Michael was saying um, on the two key factors no, for for use, and we've seen it here at WFP that it's high demand like demand for the evaluation, and on the other side, um, an interactive engagement process. But I'm thinking and, and wondering if in in the room, there's any experiences with promoting use? You know, we have demand, we have the process, but promoting use um, of the findings once the process ends, basically, once the evaluation ends, and not only with the direct clients, but also with the other potential users that are not direct, but let's say in WFP would be other country offices who might find the findings relevant and, and useful, right? And just wanted to hear if there's any experiences in the room worth sharing. Thank you. Michael, we spoke before. Thank you for this uh, content today. I, I just wanted to ask you because uh, just building on what I've heard in the past, um, your office seems to carry a lot of weight in the organization. You know, one of those slides uh, really was a testament to that. Um, so I just wanted to ask if 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 that was uh, if that was achieved over a long period of time of of, of um, giving value to their thought processes and, and, and through the recommendations, or was it uh, more like a de jure, you know, uh, legislated and, and, and giving you that role in the organization? Um, how, do, how do you think you, you uh, arrived at the, at the stage you are at uh, today? Thank you very much, Anwar. So I think we have like three topics, so maybe we start with those, and then I already see that Anna has now posted in the chat and can think as a hand raised, so we would do a second round. So, so basically, uh, I think it was, questions a bit on the independence of the function. I think there is always a challenge of remaining independent and somehow not inside the project, but then also being used or informing the, the project and the decisions um, of what we're doing. So how you kind of manage that gap. The second uh, question was around the, um, the, the using uh, also after the evaluation is done with the indirect users. So how to make it like not just the ones that the evaluation is really targeted at, but uh, other groups that we would like to maybe learn or build upon those uh, findings. And the third one was um, a bit of also the importance that is being given to the function. So the chicken and the egg problems, what goes first, uh, having a strong function that then people listen to because it's strong. Or is that function getting stronger because it's listened to and it's, it's providing interesting and useful inputs? Um, over to you, Michael. Yeah, of course, I've got the answers to absolutely everything. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think the question was also to the room, so if anybody wants to come in or yeah. try and put something yeah, that's so, that, exactly. uh, please feel free as well. <laughs> no, but I can, I, I, can, I can speak to some of these questions. Um, I mean, if I take Daniel's question first, it wasn't, it, yeah, we've got, we have some respect and legitimacy now, um, but it was hard won. And I think I said in my presentation, you're only as good as the, as the latest stuff you produce, right? You can never rest on, on your laurels um, because you only got to put out a few bad reports and then nobody will believe 
anything you put out for ages. So you you just got to maintain the standard. Um, and I know that you know there, there are sort of structures aside around the issue of independence. A lot a lot depends on the attitudes of 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 the senior management or the leadership. Um, the attitudes of 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 who the evaluation function reports to and serves. And I've seen sort of five executive directors over time, two of which were really down on evaluation and basically made it made it impossible for us to be useful because they had no interest in receiving or listening to anything we had to say. So you do need that enabling environment. And you know, even if you had a structurally fully independent office, the office would need to generate or have the emotional intelligence at the level of the office to generate um productive interactions you can be independent and 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 yet generate very adversarial interactions with with your evaluands and and that never leads to good use so it's about fostering you know so soft skills actually are quite important in 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 an individual evaluation process and as a function it's those being smart about how you interact and trying to create a space where learning can happen and, and that's a lot that's a lot easier said than done um so those are some reflections um on on um natalia's question slash comment i think it's relatively easy or it's easier after an evaluation process when you in, engage with the the key focus of the of the evaluator and the, you know the media stakeholders that are supposed to take action um, because you can design evaluation follow-up processes that do create that space for discussion and in UNEP as you know we separate out the problem or issue that needs to be solved from the prescription and if your problem is well supported by well triangulated evidence you know from a high quality evaluation well there's no issue you know the problem is there as fact it's there to be solved and you can open up a much more productive and creative co-creation kind of atmosphere by discussing prescriptions that solve the issue or problem by not insisting on the evaluation office's solution it's see that as just one one option then you open up um, much better discussions actually about how to solve the problem that the evaluation pointed out and management can figure out well maybe a different a different approach to solving it rather than the prescription that was offered in the evaluation is the way to go and as an evaluation function we can say well that's fine um, the main thing is that the organization learns and improves and, and, and solves a problem i think it's much trickier you were saying well how do you reach the indirect users i think the only way to do that is is through um, taking the time to engage with them, but that that's time intensive and, and and can be costly. And obviously, you can't do it for every evaluation, so you've got to be quite selective. Um, so those would be my initial responses, but I'm sure other people have got some good ideas too. Thank you. Yeah, maybe just reflecting from WP side, we have we have an independent evaluation function, and I think we've come a very long way in the last couple of years in building a function that is very organized organized, well-structured, has very clear uh, policies, uh, strategies, guidances, and things. So people know what to expect. I think that that makes a real difference. People know what to expect. We're trying to really promote an understanding of what evaluations are and what they're not. Um, but then at the same time, also bringing it closer to what country offices need, our country operations. So we have a centralized function, but we also do decentralized evaluations, which are purely need-based on the country um, activities, programs, and so on. So we have basically high attention, political attention uh, with the executive board on the centralized relations, which are all presented there. So there's a high interest uh, in everybody to also follow up and, and to take note and, and to take action. But at the same time, we enable at the decentralized level, at the country operation level, the countries to choose topics that they really have an interest in and that they want to learn. And we accompany that with a structured process. So it's kind of a mix of, I think, strengthening the function, but also um, taking into consideration the needs and the, the let's say, the utility um, at the country office level. Um, while both of them are done with external cabinets, so the independence is also um, guaranteed. 
and uh, I would say for the indirect use, we, we have also uh, summaries of evaluations or we do synthesis of evidence evaluations that can help to kind of build on the body of knowledge that already exists. Um, but I do think there is still a lot to do. And I agree with Michael, it's uh, actually also personal sharing and really who shares the things in which forums and being there in the important political decision making forums makes a big difference. I, if to this specific point somebody wants to come in, then just unmute your mic and speak. Otherwise, I would read other questions. Well, maybe quickly, because I raised this question myself. Uh, from my observation, the positioning of the function um, uh, matters, because uh, if the function is fully independent, um, you have the mandate and uh, there is an expectation um, that your reports are followed up. And I uh, said expectations because uh, expectations, um, they don't trigger behavioral change and sincere desire to read at your report and uh, to listen to you. Um, therefore, uh, the best uh, management teams that I worked on, like I mean managing evaluations and doing evaluation, it's uh, where regardless of the status of the function, there was a desire to have a good process, engage um, a management team and um, really build this relationship um, in terms of making it useful. So that was uh, my experience um, uh, to date. Uh, I would say it like this. Thank you. So, <laughs> a pleasure to see everybody. And uh, and I, you know, I was part of the, of the, the some of the um, experiences that the group shared, and I think that another thing was that work in that case was that the entire office was working on it, and we were really working collaboratively with with the organization and and as a team uh, to that end. We put just a lot of effort that you know that that paid off, I think, and. You know, at UNDP, the administrator, who is the former executive director of, of UNIP, still talks about it uh, every now and then as a good example of an evaluation, which is something we should be uh, very proud of. Uh, so in, in relation to the experience that we had with UNDP last, last year, um, we ran an evaluation on, on access to justice, which has um, got a little bit of uh, attention within the management and I think that some of the lessons that we have learned through it the first I think there are three overall uh, but some related to the behavioral science component that a few people mentioned so the first one is that we were definitely putting at the beginning too much attention to the executive board as as the final audience of our report rather than, than the management and when we had the the discussion at the board, I was very much underwhelmed by it. So I was like, oh, all this, <laughs> all this effort put it, and then there is maybe there is you know nothing much happening in terms of discussion. Um, and then I let a, a little bit of time pass, and then the organization came back. So another lesson that we learned probably is that it's not because we have finished an evaluation report that the organization is ready to immediately engage on it. Sometimes you have to allow time to pass and that talks about our planning. Sometimes we just, you know, put an evaluation done in a certain year and that's it. While we should consider that the engagement may happen a few months or so in the year later. And so we should account for that in terms of time allocation of staff. And the third one, which is where the behavioral science um, things happen, um, I applied a tool that I learned uh, in, in school, which is essentially pointed out to strengthening much more the personal interaction and the psychological element of personalities you deal with rather than formal commitment and formal, you know, or using the director as a messenger of communication. And so we kind of differentiated the communication we had, particularly with people that, you know, we call the handle with care or you know, the people who, are, who have uh, a lot of power, but they have very limited time and they, they may be uh, afraid of, you know, bad evaluation results coming. So I think that the trick was to differentiate the communication uh, and the engagement by not just by um, let's say uh, all type of audience in general, but also by level of power in the organization and time availability that this person have. And I will close there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Very interesting reflections. I'll take some more hands. So I think I think I was the one who had a round up next. Yes, thank you, Claudia, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mike. As usual, very um, a lot of inspiration and uh, resonates well. And also, thank you, the others, for good thoughts. Um, and yeah, more more ideas to come. I briefly wanted to follow up on the question from Natalia earlier um, by adding another question, maybe to Mike and also others here with regards to the follow-up process. So um, you referred to the formal follow-up process, I assume manager response and follow-up on that, of course, but do you also manage to have interactive dialogues in that process or does it also end for you with then the um, yeah, that presentation of findings and kind of the publication of the evaluation? Because for us, at least it's true, we try to be as engaging and um, interactive, but then afterwards a little bit more formal follow-up um, in written and um, yeah, some exchanges. And um, I also wanted to add um, to the, and maybe expand a little bit the, the scope of, yeah, not just looking at the uh, recommendations, findings, and maybe recommendations, but also at, for example, the lessons learned, which um, can be used in a little bit more for broader organizational learning. And I saw we have also Tina here. Hi, Tina. If you uh, want to uh, Say something on the reflection series from UNDP that actually was one that inspired me a lot to do more lessons learned work uh, for my organization and we have also since started a lesson series uh, which we present uh, in monthly brown bags um, um, so it's basically lessons both from our self-evaluation so similar to Mike's uh, uh, context and also from the independent evaluations and yeah, and where we try to engage uh, colleagues um, yeah, through brown bags, we also ask them to present. So it's not always us speaking. Um, we just do an introduction, but then really give the floor yeah, to others. Um, and yeah, so just wanted to add this little point and question as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Katinka. Thank you, Claudia. Ian Hopwood sitting in Dakar, Senegal. Many, many years ago, I used to be in charge of evaluation at UNICEF before it became a big job. A lot of the questions are most interesting. I'd agree on the human factor one, that it's the uh, the motivation of the head of the agency or the senior management, also with the staff members. I think both of these are important, but I'd like to emphasize a couple of things too, which I think affecting utilization and the role of evaluation. One is we still have this fear of failure. I, I, I think that you know we have to recognize that in the work we're doing, and particularly the UN Environment Program with all the uh, controversy around environment, you know, that there is a, there, there still is a unwillingness to recognize that many things are not going to work out exactly as we plan. And complexity tells us that even so-called best practices and the, pro, the, the predictability from past uh, efforts will not be applied, will not work in the future. So, so I think we have to work on getting a more open-minded approach where we recognize that there are many things we don't know, some we will never know, very difficult to predict, lots of areas of, of uh, unknowns, as they say, the known unknowns, the, the unknown unknowns. So I think there's a mindset which I think it must accompany uh, evaluation practice, evaluation culture, in order to help us move ahead for better utilization. Much more one could say, but I'll just stop there by raising the unknowns, the unpredictability, the mindsets, the, the willingness to take risks and to and to really recognize not everything is going to work. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, yeah, so so summing it up a bit and then also taking into consideration what was Paul said, I think um, the things you were mentioning is really uh, the collaborative process where everybody gives their inputs and, and comes together. Um, and I think we we're discussing how to do that after beyond the uh, end of the evaluation, and it's true, I would, would agree in, in WFP as well, it kind of slacks off there a bit. And it's not just an unwillingness necessarily to not take evaluation serious or take action, but often it's hard to action evaluation recommendations. Sometimes they're not very actionable. Um, and then also there's an issue with institutional memory. So once an evaluation li uh, lies back one or two years, nobody even remembers that it happened because people have changed um especially in the management side and people have rotated somewhere else and so so it's really about also reminding people um of, of what was discussed or what was learned uh i think the the point really on focusing on the management not just the board and not just basically the external uh, st st uh stakeholders and um 
really also taking away the the fear like showing that this is something also for for learning we, we usually say that it's for accountability but it's also for learning and for advocacy so we say that you can really learn from your relations you can prove your things and you can even use it to advocate if you have a positive evaluation um for certain certain things like continuing the program expanding uh doing certain changes I think the time factor is very interesting. So letting, giving people time to digest. Uh, I think we will have some, in some cases we have stakeholder workshops to really discuss more. So with the results already and not just um, during the process, uh, but still to really transform that into action is not always easy. Um, and adjusting, of course, also to the level and the power. So we have uh, sometimes summaries, so two pages or executive summaries, a lot of relations have that. But even that is not always easy because then those summaries don't have the details. So it's about kind of getting the right uh, middle ground. Um, and uh, I think one thing we were discussing is also to have more talking points when you want to communicate about results uh, of an evaluation externally. And uh, yeah, I think, as you said, Ian, we, we can't know everything. So sometimes expectation management is a big thing as well that people want to think in a relation will tell them everything they ever needed to know. Uh, but there's a lot of different tools to, to generate evidence and knowledge, and it needs to come together. So here we had in the chat, it was also you need, I, uh, Rahel had said, I assume that you need a strong relation culture at the agency in order to foster use. So how did you go about building such a culture evaluation community of practice? And then Josephine was saying, I just attended a forum by the EU funded Indeed project. Main takeaway about the use was the importance of making sense of evidence by investing in the interpretation of data from evaluations to facilitate critical thinking about solutions. As evaluators, we should be good facilitators and co-create recommendations with the users. So I think that, comes back to this point of like having recommendations that are useful and that people can action and know what kind of to do with <laughs> rather than just saying I, I took note and um, I'll take care of it. So maybe back to Michael, you want to come in with some points? Yeah, oh, some good points. I, I like Samus' point about time. I, I would I would link that time with, so we're talking about recommendation compliance. So I think you think about not only the time it takes to absorb findings, but you think about the span of management involved in recommendation compliance. So, for example, you know we kind of we're kind of now figuring out that we need a two-track process. So, when you have a discrete value and like a project, we say, okay, twelve-month compliance process. You 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 articulate your recommendations to be actionable and to be actionable within a 12 month period. And then you check your compliance in that period and you close them all out after, after 12 months, right? And just with the level of compliance, did they do it or not? Or did they do it partially? So you, you know all your project level recommendations with a smaller span of management are gonna be closed out. Sometimes a project level evaluation will highlight a problem that requires a broader span of management to solve it. So that has to be escalated and similarly, your strategic evaluations are likely to generate recommendations that require a broad span of management action across different parts of the house to solve the problem. That takes longer. So you need a different, you need a different timeline to fix those kinds of problems because those problems require multiple actions and, and the cogs of management, you know, sometimes run slowly. So we're in the process of, of we have the one track and we're developing the second track, which would be, you know, a longer time frame to implement more strategic recommendations. And you put into the mix there, bringing back those recommendations to your senior management team every year. And you basically say, what does the narrative of change look like against those higher level problems? And what progress have we made? And then you're sort of asking the question, well, how far up the curve of, where the law of diminishing returns applies have we got and at what point do we say okay well we've made quite a bit of progress we probably would have to spend a huge amount of effort to get the last 15 percent maybe we close it out now and move on to the next thing because new problems are being identified the whole time so that, that's one thing about evaluation follow-up and yeah we do it interactively so 
once the evaluation is finished, you're saying, right, let's have a discussion with the managers about what about what the sensible prescription to solve the problem is. So that's part of the sort of follow up process. So, yeah, I think that's important. Um, fear of fa failure. That's quite interesting. Um, yeah, we do identify projects that fail. I think from the environment side of things, it's just it's just the magnitude of effort against the scale of the problem. So you've got you've got you know UNEP trying to solve the world's environment problems with with, with a budget that that is you know pales into insignificance compared to something as simple as government subsidies on 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 fuel. You know, so it's just like total imbalance in terms of the level of investment required to solve the problem um and so so failure is almost guaranteed unless unless people of the world rise up and the government's with them to actually start fixing the environment so that's a slightly different issue um but i, I like the idea of, of of building more on lessons we've tried to do that a number of times in the past um i think identifying and synthesizing patterns across lessons is important but how are you going to get them used well again you need to spend the time to engage with the house or with the intended users of these lessons and interact with them to stand any chance of, of having them used um, and just a little bit on culture of you know a replica of one <laughs> this evaluation function that i've been in all i can say is you build a culture slowly and over time and yeah it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight and you've just got to be consistently focused on on knowing what your role is and trying to get good people to do good work and we've been lucky in that regard over the years we've got a couple on the call here um and you know they've all helped build the culture of excellence within the within the function and then the house begins to respect that over time and you need to ally that with with you know getting a bit of structural independence in the mix and having having that um having being lucky enough to have a senior manager that actually understands the role of the function and respect that independence and 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 know how to use evaluation as a as a tool for for feedback um and a tool for learning and improvement i think i'll stop there i'm sure others have got interesting insights to share too thanks thank you very much so so given the time so we have seven minutes left uh so i would maybe say will you you come in with your things and and maybe michael you pick one or two key ones um and then we'll we'll close the session uh so i think fernando was the next one yeah good morning to everyone um good morning from colombia good afternoon to all of you um this is the first time i take uh, part on these meetings and and i believe someone from itu and the reason is, believe it or not, uh, the governing body of the ITU just decided to set up an evaluation function. We are really lagging behind. So for me, uh, especially what Michael presented is very, very useful to to create a kind of um, how to say, uh, yeah, to present some some baseline for for what we want. Uh, some people in our management, by the way, is this Chatham House rule? I suppose not. Well, in any case, I can defend my opinion. They claim that the um, the chief of the evaluation unit should be a P4. Someone say P5. So that slide from Michael will be great for me to make the case, at least for a P5. Um, uh, but I have a question, Michael. When you mentioned that you've done 12 evaluations per year in the first um, phase and 13 in the second one, are all of these uh, internal evaluations or are you counting external evaluations where you acted as an evaluation manager, evaluation manager? I mean, rebuilding the theory of change and building the, the terms of reference and so on for us it's very important and if anyone else here has kind of materials which will be good for for me or for us it's not me i mean i'm not going to be that person that unit but i'm interested in that to build a case for having a strong evaluation unit please share that with 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 us with me thank you Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, next one was Alina. So I wanted to add reflection about follow-up process uh, and uh, emphasis on learning, that uh, it's important uh, to engage and also to explain um, uh, 
continuously uh, continuous engagement uh, focus on learning and not only on accountability and i know that some organizations where i work and in general are better than others maybe sending newsletters and i know the cases even continuously updating providing the summaries about lessons learned and even having training for managers uh, to introduce evaluation function and uh, how you can use evaluation of course, here is a little asterisk that uh, not all uh, units in general have communication function and uh, it's not easy to do. And uh, my colleague um, like Rachel doesn't have time, but probably could have uh, spoken how uh, we do it in IEA, where we try to set up such type of uh, newsletter because she was working a lot on this. Um, and um, yeah, we can maybe uh, later on share experience in different webinars uh, on, on this subject, uh, including like functions so uh, who try to strengthen uh, evaluation function or setting up evaluation function uh, like only uh, now from the start. Thank you, Lovina. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I just wanted to, to share my experience of, about absorption capacity that was brought up by a couple of colleagues on, on we have so many lessons learned, recommendations, but many times I think that we're just doing it for the sake of checking the box that we've done in an accountability and then we do a brown bag lunch and presentation and then everyone forgets the evaluation. If it's put on the shelf, a soft copy shelf because we don't print um, and then we forget about it. So one thing that, I, that we did back in my previous job, right now I'm at UNFPA in Dakar as a MNE advisor, but in my previous job at Unit 8, which is a virtual in, in Geneva, we had developed a catalog of, of uh, lessons learned and recommendations. Because what we've seen many times, the program uh, people, it's when they're developing a program and when they're looking for something specific, they say, oh, there was an evaluation, where is that, uh, um, where, where is that lesson learned? So we, we created this very simple spreadsheet that you could filter by thematics, by uh, uh, transformative result, as we call it, or by outcome, output, and they could quickly look up the, the um, lesson learned. And then if they want more details, they could go into the evaluation report and dig further. So that was something that we had, I had seen that had increased the uh, utility of, of evaluation. So just while we're not doing this yet at UNFPA, I hope I can advocate for it with my senior management that we do something like that because we've seen increase in use through that uh, uh, database. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lovina. Um, I'll, I'll, Michael, I'll give you the last word, but I'll get in some, some word in first, uh, just uh, in case people have to jump off at, at 30 exactly. So thank you everybody for being here today. This is the first uh, webinar that we're doing in this evaluation use series. So just to explain, this is a subgroup of the subgroup of one of the UN, UN working groups. And um, we have uh, identified certain topics where there have already been webinars or where there has been interest to create webinars on. And so today the idea was to be uh, quite generic and open to also see what other people have as ideas and things. And I think a lot of the things you shared today could be future topics, like specific detailed topics for the webinars, um, be it tools like practical tools and approaches that you could share, or be it um, uh, specific topics like how to engage in your management uh, or whatever. So, so it's really useful that we had, I think, this, this first reflection today. So, Fernando, you didn't miss anything <laughs> because we didn't have it before. Um, and then I think uh, overall, uh, I would really want to thank um, the members of the, the work stream of the youth group who have been working on this uh, together. Uh, so here, and if I don't see anybody here, please forgive me, but I, I'm seeing that Alina and Katika and then Kevin uh, had been active and Hoshika is actually the one uh, who has done a lot of the behind the scenes work. So you haven't actually um, heard her except in the beginning, but she's the one who significantly contributed to this. So big thanks to Hoshika. And um, Fernando for maybe experience and change on how to set up relations and things. Um, don't hesitate to reach out and we can look into that. And with that, I would like to give the word back to Michael and I'm hoping hoping to see all of you next year, probably in quarter one, we will have the next webinar and we'll be announcing it uh, early next year. Yeah, well, thanks. It's been an interesting discussion and thanks everyone for joining and participating. It's been good. I'll, I'll just quickly answer a couple of Fernando's questions. He'll be relieved to know we were, we were I'm talking about evaluation management because that's how we got the, the leverage from a few, a few numbers of staff to cover a large number of evaluations. So we had to sort of uh, 
get our act together in terms of 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 consistent process and approach so that we can crank through a lot of evaluations with a small number of people. I would I would urge you, Fernando, to have a look. There's a tool called the um, UNEG Maturity Matrix. That's quite a good tool for a new function to look through, and it kind of gives um, the range of 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 possible states where you may be against against the norms and standards, basically. So that that's quite a useful tool for thinking about the attributes um, that you'll need as you move um, an evaluation function forward in ITU. Um, and you can feel free to reach out to UNIG colleagues if you ever want um, some advice or just a friendly listening ear. Um, I liked Anna's um, controversial question about, yeah, don't, don't put all your eggs in the in the evaluation follow up basket. <laughs> I think if you've got your process right, then evaluation follow up gets a hell of a lot easier anyway because you've got the process buy in. So I think I think um, yeah, all the things Anna was saying about trying to build that ownership and, and being patient in terms of timing uh, are very relevant. Oh, just yeah, just a little one on you know how you know how do you how do you avoid evaluation findings ending up on the virtual shelf. Well, one thing you can, you know, when you're thinking about the function evaluation function as a system and it's feeding back into other parts of an organizational system, well, then try and build in a requirement for the part of the house that's designing new things to have to look at evaluation products that are in that theme and actually build on them and quote them in planning documents. So you're sort of closing that loop between between evaluation and design. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already do that, but making that a sort of policy of the house that that's required at all levels of planning, not just at, at the level of an intervention, but also at the level of, of strategy, then requires the house to actually go back and, and see what's on the virtual shelf and try and make better use of it. I think I'll stop there since we're a little bit over time. Um, but yeah, it's been great, really enjoyed. Um, reading your questions hearing your your questions and viewpoints it's been very interesting thanks a lot thank you thank you michael for making it interesting and engaging and thank you everybody who who uh, spoke up or put a, a, a consideration or reflection in the chat and um, yeah i'm looking forward to continuing these discussions uh we might send out a little survey and we will also try to give you uh so so to hear from you how, what you felt we could do better what we felt was was helpful for you and so that we can take that into consideration so our own little evaluation <laughs> thank you very much and with that i wish you a happy monday and a good week <laughs>